I am Ashley Kerr, and I am here with my co-host, Felipe Mejia. Felipe, I have nothing to harp on you today because I feel like I harped on Steve Rosenberg so much during this episode that I'm all spent. <laughs> That's hilarious. You are really digging into Steve, your mentor, which I think is great because we have a great show today. We have a mentor and a mentee, right? This gentleman won 20 grand at the last Bigger Pockets conference through a uh, partnership with Mind. Um, and Steve, his mentor, picked him out of 50 people to mentor him on an out of state investing property. And Steve talks about why he picked him as a mentee. And then, you know, um, Joe talks about, you know, earning and, and winning that mentorship with Steve. I think it's going to answer a lot of questions about mentee and mentor relationships. Yeah. And Steve is actually my mentor and I loved getting to see him in action with another mentee and how they're doing an out of state deal. And, you know, they break down the deal, how the numbers work, but just the mindset stuff they get into is really great. So make sure you guys listen to the whole thing. At the end, they're going to tell you how to reach out to both of them and what they're doing with this out-of-state deal. Steve, Joe, welcome to the show, man. How are you guys? Great. Thanks for having me. Doing well. Thanks for having us. Super pleasure to have both of you guys on. Yeah, to talk about how you guys know each other. So can you guys talk about this contest that Joe won? Yeah, sure. So uh, Mind Property Management Company, uh, who I work with, did a contest. Uh, they actually announced it last year at Bigger Pockets Conference uh, Number 1. And it was the $20,000 giveaway that we were going to give away $20,000 for an investor to use as down payment money when they purchase property. And so Mind did a huge amount of investing in uh, marketing and figuring out if this makes sense, would this actually help an investor? And the, everything pointed to yes. So we went down the path of now figuring out who will win this contest. And so I believe we had, I'm gonna say about 2,500 entrants, people that entered from the Bigger Pockets Conference and people from other, you know, channels that came in. And we basically just kept whittling it down and whittling it down um, through different, you know, um, criteria. The final stretch was actually, we got down to the last 50. And I, I wasn't really into it up until this point. And when it got down to 50, they said, hey, we're going to give you this spreadsheet of all 50. And now we need to figure out who, who do we want? We need your help. So I looked in and I thought, okay, who, who would be someone that we could help as an investor that, um, you know, would benefit the most from this. I took that list. I got it down to about 20. And good old Joe's still hanging in there. He's still hanging on, on, on the list here. And the final 20, we said, okay, we're going to be doing a lot of videos with this person. We're thinking of doing a mini documentary. We're thinking of doing all this stuff. So let's make sure the person understands how to use a camera. Are they, you know, let, let's, let's have them do like a quick five minute video or a couple minute video intro of themselves, why they want to win and those kinds of things. So we go down this list of the top 20 and I actually personally reached out to each 20 of the people I called them or sent them a text message so that they realized like, hey, this is, we really, you really did make the top 20. Now this is the next step. And everybody turned in their videos except one person. And that person was out of the country on vacation with his family uh, in uh, Cambodia. And we almost closed it. And I was like, man, I can't believe this guy did not turn in his video. Like I thought like, this is the guy. Like I'm thinking <laughs> this could be the guy. And I get a phone call from him saying, hey, man, I just landed. I got in from out of the country. If you give me, you know, the, the ability, because it was, it was either, it was just about to close. Yeah. And sure enough, he got it in under the wire. And we thought, we watched the video and we thought, this is the guy. This, this, this guy deserves to win. This, this is the go-to guy. And so he, uh, that's how he won. 
<laughs> well, Steve, first of all, I entered into that contest and I did, did not really? know that you handpicked the person. <laughs> and I, I'm just wondering, can you please explain why, why I was not picked? Yeah, I think you were too famous already. You were, you were already too famous, Ashley. <laughs> That's awesome. So, Joe, tell us about what, what that feeling was like getting that phone call, knowing you were a finalist and finding out that you won. I got to say, like the initial feeling was was super excited. So I landed in San Francisco, plugged my American SIM card into my phone because I'd had a Cambodian SIM card in it. And I get all these voicemails. And so I'm going through them and I listen to it and it's Steve. And he's like, hey, I'm following up on the email I sent you. And like, you're in the top 20. And at first I was like, oh my gosh. And then he's like, he gave the date for the, the submission of the video. And it was like that day. And I, like my heart just sank. And I was like, what email? I go back and sure enough, it's in my spam folder. And so I call Steve up and I'm like, Hey, like I'll make a video right now in San Fran airport. Or if I can, if you give me till tonight, like I'll get home to Denver or we'll visit my family and I'll, and I'll make a video tonight and get it to you in your inbox tonight. He was like, yeah, man. But I mean, the, I, I entered never expecting that I was going to win. So um, it was just sort of, I heard it on the bigger pockets podcast I think Brandon and, and David were talking about it on the way to work. And I had like 10 minutes before work. So I filled out the questionnaire and then I honestly sort of forgot about it because I never win things like that. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was pretty incredible to get to the top 20. Uh, but uh, I had a couple more steps actually to get, to get through all the way to the end. But, yeah, I will say knowing that you entered and that we're both sort of, you know, Steve, Steve is <laughs> – Steve is our mentor for, to both of us. I yeah. am going to hold that over you for the rest of your life because yeah, as you should, you chose as you me should, over yeah, you, yeah, right, right, yeah. And I actually, the first time Steve and I ever talked, I had to message him on Instagram. He didn't even approach me. So, and yeah, I definitely am low on the totem pole. <laughs> Joe, real quick, let me put in there, bud. So. Um, what were you doing in real estate before you won this? And what was your, what was your plan to do with the earnings from, um, uh, you know, this contest real estate prior to that, we had, my wife and I've had a rental that we had was, was our primary residence. The Marine Corps moved us and we kept it, kept it as a rental. So we've had that for a few years. And then in 2018, I went on deployment to Afghanistan. While I was there, I started doing more and more reading about like real estate investing. I actually tried to buy a few properties while I was in Afghanistan. It didn't work out. And that's honestly probably for the better. But right. I got back. And then so this is fall of 2019 when this contest. So I had just I was in the middle of the rehab stage on my very first burr, a tiny little two bedroom, one bath here locally in eastern North Carolina. So that would technically be my second investment property. And then um, yeah. So, and then my plan for the earnings was to wait to refinance that one and then do another burr with that money, um, which is what we ended up doing. So, which I'm sure we'll get to later. Yeah. And Steve, do you want to talk about, uh, how the process first started with Joe? Once he was announced the winner, how did you become his mentor? What were the first steps there? Yeah. So, you know, I really thought of this as a great opportunity uh, with bigger pockets and, and mind property management to kind of come together. It's all about education, trying to help investors figure out this puzzle. And one of the things we wanted Joe to do was to be able to understand how to live in one place and invest long distance in another. And so that was kind of the strategy that we talked to him. And would you be open to this concept? if I coached you and mentored you through the process, would you be open? And he was, he was all in. Um, and so what we decided to do was we were going to fly to North Carolina and meet Joe in person. And he had two properties. He had one property that he was in the middle of rehabbing. He had another one that he was about to close on. So I thought, okay, why don't we go there? Let's meet Joe. Let's do a bunch of filming. We brought our camera guy with us did a whole bunch of filming. Let's walk the properties and maybe I can give Joe some tips and some advice on the property that he's rehabbing now on just things that I would do. And then let's go look at the property that he's going to buy and I'll give him my perspective. So we showed up in North Carolina, um, me, myself, uh, myself, Alex and Dan, our camera guy. And we met Joe uh, and met at the property. Actually, they, they met Joe the night before I flew in from another destination. And I came in and met them the next morning. And we went to the house that Joe was in the middle of rehabbing, walked it. I gave him just my perspective of what I would do differently with this property or just some tips and tricks of things that I thought 
Joe was already doing a great job with it. He was already knee deep in this property. A um, lot of tips and pointers all on film. Then we went to the other house that he was in the middle of purchasing, which subsequently he did buy. And this was more of a work, uh, was going to be more intensive. And then we ended up having a whole conversation on that. Uh, and then what do we do from there, Joe? Before we go on, Joe, let me, let me butt in here. I do have a question that I know that our listeners are going to want to know because we always give advice on how to be a good mentee or how to follow through or how to add value. But let me ask Steve, Steve, you had 50 people that you had to pick from. If it wasn't going to be Joe, what in your mind was your criteria to picking a mentee? Because I know that our listeners are all going to probably be close to Joe's spot and they want a good mentor. But what in your mind said Joe stands out? Well, first uh, was not Ashley. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great um, answer. Yeah, yeah. First, first and foremost. Uh, <laughs> no, I, you know, what I was looking at is, is from my perspective, I've, I've helped a lot of people and I've mentored a lot of people. And I thought, okay, can I add value? to what this person wants to do. So if they want to flip a multifamily complex in Minnesota, that's not my specialty. If somebody wants to buy something that I'm an expert in and that I know that I can help them, and are they open to doing what we needed them to do? Meaning, did they have the financial means to buy a property? And Joe had the financial means. This was helpful, but this was not the only money that he had to invest in real estate. So I can't help someone if they don't have the, the assets and the tools. So what I look for is number one, is someone coachable? Are they willing to listen to what I have to say and my recommendations? They don't have to do it, but are they open to listening to another way of thinking? And do they have the assets to get the job done? They don't even need to have done a deal yet. My thing is, is I can teach anyone to buy real estate. And as we hear this story, I mean, we, we bought a piece of property, uh, Joe and I did, sight unseen. We can do all the mechanics, but do you mentally have the ability to do what I ask you to do? And are you going to stick to it? And that's, that's what I look for in someone. And you can see by the words people say, right, their vocabulary and the words that they talk about and their goals and their strategies, is that something that I can help them with or am I not the person for them? And, and that's why if I was looking for someone else, another Joe, I would say, can I actually add value in this person's life? Um, are they someone that we can help become a better person because of it? Or is this just going to be a waste and they may lose the house down the road? So that, that's what I look for. Good. That's perfect. I think a lot of our listeners want to know that they're, you know, a lot of them uh, are probably starting out and they're like, how can I add value to, to, to a mentor? But not just that, you know, you have to be coachable, right? And, and I feel like maybe Joe was that, right? He was probably coachable to you. You accepted the task because that's what it was. I'm sure you had to put in work as well, but you saw that Joe was going to reciprocate positively and take your words to heart. Because if not, you're just beating a dead horse. Well, yeah. And, you know, look, at the end of the day, Joe Joe is, you know, out there fighting for our country. You know, it, it, I think that he deserves to me uh, the respect to to give him my time. And if he's willing to do what I ask, I'm willing to do what what he needs. And I'm willing to step up and, and do all the things. And Joe and I have had many, many conversations about many things. But it's uh, to me, it's important if somebody, you know, it's not always one-sided. And it's not always, some people ask for a mentor and they think just because they pay me money or they want to pay or whatever the case may be, that that gives them the right just to do it. I, I don't need someone. I want someone that's willing to do the work and that, that has their heart into it. That's more important to me than, than any financial means, in my opinion. I love that. I love that. What is the structure of the mentorship now? So how often do you guys talk? I mean, is it just um, a weekly meeting? Do you guys text? What's kind of involved with your mentorship agreement all the above yeah <laughs> um, but uh i would say the way it started so let, i'll just finish when we went and we saw joe at camp lejeune um I, I had the opportunity to talk to the military squadron his squadron a lot of people wanted to know about you know being an airline pilot as well as real estate and how it ties in so joe set up that i could meet and talk with a lot of the guys which was really really cool just giving back and then we we talked joe and i talked a lot uh, as far as what is the strategy going to be and how do we get this going? So we, we kind of laid out the, the, the footprint and the, the answer was, is I'm not really sure how we're going to do this, but you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm here at your disposal. 
Let's just start the process. First, we have to figure out big picture. What cities do we want to invest in? Um, we obviously, we are wanted him to invest in a mined market, preferably, because that's something that we can help manage the asset and we can have boots on the ground, which came into play downstream. And so we started off with what cities does mind manage in and are they investable to his goals and do they align? Did you guys figure that out together, like analyze each market together? Or is that something Joe went and did and then kind of brought it to you and you gave your opinion on? It was more the latter. Like he, yeah. Steve would give me homework essentially um, yeah. that, that we would talk about. And then I would go put in the legwork and the effort and then bring back Steve knows now, like I'm a spreadsheet guy. So I'd usually bring him back a spreadsheet <laughs> yeah. with all my research. And then we would have coaching sessions that we would do. I uh, probably about bi-weekly about every other week, a couple times a month. Yeah. And then we'd talk through sort of what his taskers for me had been and what, the, what was the next steps, actionable items. Yeah. And, and what I wanted him to do was I wanted him to basically prove to me why he wanted to invest in a certain market, explain to me why that made sense to him. And it wasn't an emotional decision that the numbers were dictating the deal. And then we had to go through, okay, now that we know what market and that aligns with his goals, now we got to figure out the strategy and then the tactic of the actual property. So we you know, we did it backwards. And every time that we would talk, I would give him homework. And some of it was kind of a little bit off center where he had to actually figure out where does his time go in the day? Cause he's not able to analyze the deals. So then we had to figure out, okay, where's your time going? Why do you not have time? And so, you know, a couple of these, even though it's, you know, like a karate kid, right? He's waxing the car. He doesn't understand why he's waxing the car, but it helps him downstream. So when he was able to understand where his time went, he was able to all of a sudden segment that off to be able to find deals and be focused when he's looking and it's not a sidetrack. So using leverage and a lot of other things are, are part of what I wanted him to learn. Steve, what's your advice for someone who wants to do the same thing? They want to figure out where their time is going. What's something they could do for that? You know, I, I used to have a hard time understanding this process because it's it's it kind of is like sand, right? It just drips away. Uh, the best thing I would advise someone to do when they're trying to figure out, you know, a lot of people are very reactive in their day, meaning the day is gone and they don't know what they did and why they did it, but they know they're tired and they know they put out a lot of fires, is to start tracking. Like if you want to figure out where your money's going, you go on a budget and you start writing down all of your money. If you want to go on a diet and lose weight, you start tracking down what you eat. If you want to see where your time's going, start writing down from the time you wake up to the time you're done with the day, write down everything you do. Then at the end of the day, totalize what each project was. So two hours email, one hour social media, whatever it is, and write an executive summary at the end of the day as to where your time is going. And that executive summary makes you basically write and realize where your time is going. And if you do that for two weeks, I guarantee everyone who's watching this, if you do this for two weeks, you would be shocked that you would realize, wow, I'm spending a lot of time doing this, a lot of time doing that. And is that even closer, taking me closer to my goal or is it taking me further away from my goal? So just writing it down and seeing it on paper and writing that executive summary, I'm a big believer in accountability. So having someone to actually give it to, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a, an accountability partner, having somebody make sure that you give it to them is essential to making this work. That's really smart. Um, I, I got a friend, Diego Corzo, actually has a net worth tracker and he is annoyingly with it. I mean, weekly, he'll look at it and he'll plug and play. And if he has a month where his net worth didn't go up, he goes back and figures out why. And I think that's probably the same thing with our time. If we can go back and check, like you just said, what did we do this last month and what was productive and what wasn't productive, then it's keeping yourself or someone else helping you keep yourself accountable to what are you really doing with your time? And that goes the same thing with your money. What are you really doing uh, with your money? And before we move on a little bit to the rookie deal that we're going to talk about, um, Joe, can you give us a little bit of your background? You know, what is it that you've done? We've talked a little military. Um, what else? So give us a little background on yourself there. Yeah. So broad strokes. I was born in Colorado. I lived there till I was uh, in my early teens. And then my family moved to Cambodia. Parents were missionaries. Um, my dad worked for an organization that combats human trafficking there. I, so I spent my high school, middle school and high school years in Cambodia. Came back to the States for college. I went to the uh, Naval Academy um, and then commissioned as a, a Marine Corps officer in uh, 2012, that was. Uh, 
after basic training, went down to flight school in Pensacola, Florida. That's where we bought that first house that is, is now an investment property. My wife and I, I got married right after I graduated. Um, and then hopped around to a few different duty stations with the Marine Corps until we ended up here in North Carolina. And I am a uh, Cobra attack helicopter pilot is my, uh, my primary job in the Marine Corps. And then, <laughs> uh, but that I'm, sounds, yeah. that sounds really like BA dude. Like I would <laughs> say that at every bar. Yeah. It is, we, we, did, we, we did get to check it out. He gave us a tour. I got to say it was pretty cool. I, I almost couldn't get out of it, but it was pretty cool to get into it. You had to pry Steve <laughs> out of it. Yeah. Like, get out, bro. It was, it was a tight fit getting in there, but yeah. very, very cool. Yeah. Guys, Steve said so not supposed to be uh, attack helicopter pilots. Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, but uh, that's hilarious. Keep going, Joe. Yeah. So no. So yeah, I'm, I'm active duty Marine Corps. Um, actually getting ready to deploy here shortly uh, in the next couple months. And then, uh, yeah, we'll see. I'm, you know, what, what, what is next? It, I sort of keep all doors open at all times. So whether or not I stay in the Marine Corps till 20 years or, or I get out and do real estate investing full time, um, I sort of just keep all doors open and, and keep going towards my goals. But the eventual plan uh, is to get out and do, you know, do real estate full time. But uh, for now, I'm very much enjoying uh, my job in the Marine Corps. Although, you know, the, the longer you stay in, the less fun stuff you do and the more paperwork and desk stuff you do. So I think at the point where it's no longer fun and I'm no longer enjoying it, that'll probably be the point that I that I get. And out. what you're doing is building that option for yourself so that when you are ready to retire, you can with exactly. Real estate. Exactly. I think one thing to point out here is while we were in North Carolina, uh, we had a really good conversation and, and we got it on film too, of talking with Joe and his wife about, you know, this is something that I think is important for all rookies out there getting into real estate is making sure that you have alignment with your spouse or significant other. And so that everyone's on the same page going down the same direction to the same destination. And, you know, she had some concerns about Joe getting out of the military and, and going into real estate full time. And, you know, we kind of talked it through and, and I, I don't know, Joe, maybe we'll see how, I don't know how it was when, after <laughs> I left, but at the time, you know, when we talked it through, I think that it, it really was, I thought a great conversation of understanding, you know, the other person's side, who's not, she's not really into real estate like Joe is. She doesn't watch the podcast shows as much or, you know, go to the seminars, but she's affected by Joe's decision. And so she had some concerns about his time availability and, and we had a great, I, I thought it was a great conversation of just kind of unpacking that, that we didn't even realize it was going to be so, so good. But I thought it was, I thought it was very helpful, hopefully for her as well to, to understand what you were embarking on and where you were going on your journey. And I, I think it's important that more people need to do that, I think. Oh, that was fantastic. That was probably I'm going to say that was the boat. That was the most valuable thing to come out of this experience, even more valuable than the 20,000. Cause now she's completely <laughs> on board. Yeah. Now she lets me just buy it, like buy and find and buy more properties. <laughs> so smart and, man, uh, smart yeah. man. He's giving his wife a shout out. Smart exactly. man. He knows he's going to listen. <laughs> so let me, let me ask you what city uh, did you decide on and why with Steve? And then I'll let Steve answer as well. Why, why he, why he, why he agreed to that city. Uh, so I decided on the Atlanta, the greater Atlanta metro area. Um, okay. And it was process of elimination in terms of, so I started out by just looking at like sort of big demographics. I, I wanted to invest in areas where uh, good population and job growth. And, you, you know, you, in big demographic terms, you see the U.S. moving south and west. So, and then I also wanted to invest in a market that where $20,000 would make a little bit more of a dent some of the markets mines in is, you know, like West coast, California, $20,000 is like, that's your closing costs or not even your closing costs, you know? So, uh, with the idea of being, I want to do small single family bird deal, ideally, um, I wanted somewhere where that $20,000 was going to kind of have the most legs. So I narrowed it down to, I think it was six markets, Steve, in the, in the South and Southeastern United States. And this is when I went a little crazy with, uh, with the spreadsheet. And uh, I just, uh, I mean, I just started looking at, at everything possible that should, that I could think of that would factor into future growth. Like this is not something I'm going to flip in a year or two years. Like this is a, I want to establish myself in a market that I'm going to be in for a long time and I'm going to hold real estate there for a long time. So job growth, you know, presence of fortune 500 and fortune 1000 companies, um, you know, me median income 
percentage of renters percent or age of the homes in the area. Like I just sort of had a spreadsheet and then I would kind of go through and assign values to how they ranked out. And then I think it was Houston, uh, Atlanta and Tampa sort of rose to the top. And I just liked, it was sort of a toss up between the three. Atlanta was sort of a happy medium between the two for me. And I liked being in the Southeast. I've got a property in Florida, got properties here in North Carolina you know, Atlanta, it's, it's enough geographic diversification for me, but I'm still sort of all in the, in the Southeast. So, you know, if I wanted to go over there, it's, it's not that big a deal. So really it could, of those top three, it could have been any of them. Um, but, uh, I was able to, uh, to find a really good agent in Atlanta and that helped me, that sort of helped me solidify the, the deal there. Steve. Yeah. You know, my thing is, is whenever anyone's looking for a property, it's got to make sure that the numbers make sense towards the goal. So every time he asked me or thought of a new city, my question always was, does this align with the goal? So that was the first question I'd always throw back at him. And then he'd have to justify why it did or did not. And so just because he likes Atlanta doesn't mean he needs to invest in Atlanta. And so unless the numbers dictate that it makes sense aligning with his goals as the price and, and everything else that we looked at. And so I agreed, Atlanta made sense uh, based on the data, based on the numbers. Mind manages properties there. So we have assets on the ground. So we're able to help him with that. And, you know, at some point you just got, you, you know, you got to, you got to pull the trigger and you got to pick one. And so we said, okay, Atlanta's where it's at. Let's, let's make it happen. So that was, that was step one was identifying the market and making sure that that market aligns with the goal. What's the next step? Let's let's engineer this project for those that are listening. Found the guy, found the city. What happens next? Yeah, so next was once we found the city, okay, let's see, do the numbers actually work on actual deals that are going on there? So what are the non-negotiables that you have? Is it equity capture? Is it, you know, he wanted to burr the property. So we had to look at that ratio of what he was going to get it for, the hard money, you know, how he was going to acquire it, what he was going to do next. Uh, and so we went through that mental mathematics on these deals. So he had, I think he had what, Joe, about 12 deals on the spreadsheet that matched what yeah. criteria, Matt, you know, was, was good for you. And that what's important to understand here is just because this works for Joe, this may not work for someone else because the numbers may not make sense towards their goals. If Joe had a three-year window that he wanted to get in and out, this Atlanta may not make sense. It may be a negative geared high appreciation area as opposed to what Atlanta did for him. So just because Joe's in Atlanta, I don't think everyone needs to rush to Atlanta if it's not aligned with their goals. And that was the one thing that was vital that I made sure that he understood. Um, and then of the cash flow, equity capture, um, other variables, which one is the most important? Because you're not going to get all three. So then we, he had to split up and say, okay, this one, I'm capturing this much equity, but I've got a lot of rehab costs. And what are the days on market? So I told him, you know, we need to look at these variables. You may buy this property thinking days on market are five days, but maybe it's really 60 days. So we need to think of all these variables in the new city that we're in and in that sub market because Atlanta is a big city. Now we started digging into where in Atlanta, because just like all cities, they have high areas and low areas. And what we had, I think we had two deals fall out because yeah. of other stuff. So we had to kind of keep massaging this to make the deal work. Yeah, we, we went under contract twice um, and then pulled out of both of them. Those good learning experiences though. Yeah. And why did and, you pull out of them? Uh, well, it's uh, inspections for both of them. Uh, yeah. This is why I highly, highly recommend getting an inspection done. I don't, I'll never buy a house. I, one of my first deals here in North Carolina, I, I didn't get an inspection done and it cost me money and I'll never not do that again. And it saved me on two deals in Atlanta. Um, one of them, it had rained all weekend prior and it hadn't rained in like three weeks there. And when the inspector went right after the rain, we found out that the, the basement was flooding and we would essentially have to like regrade all of the, all of the around it. And it just blew that budget out of the water. And then the other one um, just found a lot of stuff in terms of uh, it would need to be like rewired and replumbed stuff that my agent hadn't seen on walkthrough. So once again, it just blew the budget up. We went back to the sellers. We're like, Hey, this is what we found. Like requesting to drop it to here. They didn't want to. So we're like, okay. But if I hadn't done the inspection, then, you know, we, I, it would not have been a good deal at all. So, 
And I think part of this too was assembling the team. So yeah. now Joe and I have neither been to Atlanta still. And so assembling the team of getting the realtor and Joe ended up finding uh, on bigger pockets, found a realtor in the forums. And, you know, we started grouping the team to having conversations of who does he need to have on his team that understands where he's going as the goal and making sure that everyone is in line with what we wanted. So that if you're going to invest in another city, you really got to think about where is your team? Who do you need to have on that team? And are they aligned with your goal? Now, this guy didn't know Joe. He didn't know anything about Joe, but he was aligned enough to do what we asked him to do based on what goal uh, Joe's goal and strategy were. Yeah. And, and the learning experience too. I mean, I by no means did this without many missteps, but the learning experience was assembling that team. Like I think people, they want to, they don't want to feel like they're a burden on people. So they want to wait until they have work to do for somebody to like bring that person in. Right. But what I learned through this experience is like, it's okay to reach out to people to be like, this is my plan. I'd like to bring you like ask them some questions, make sure they're a good fit, but then bring them on board because the very first deal, although we pulled out because of the inspection, I, I never would have bought that deal if I had been talking to who's going to end up uh, managing the property for, for me. If I've been talking to the property manager at the time, because I would have found out from her that the rents that myself and the, my agent were projecting for that were completely unrealistic. So I should have had you know that property manager on board, even though I had no work for that property manager yet. I should have had them on the team earlier. Um, and that's why when we bought in the area we did, it was with... Uh, you know, a lot of injects from from the property manager. That's a really good insight. That's a really good nugget that people should go back and and, and kind of write down. You know, that property manager is super crucial, and they'll give you information that you didn't even know you needed. But earlier, Steve said that you found um, you know your agent on Bigger Pockets. Anyone can actually go to biggerpockets.com forward slash agents to find a top agent in the market where you want to invest. So that's kind of how you find your agent. Uh, is that right, Joe? For Atlanta. Yeah, I, I did a little bit of a more roundabout way because um, I wanted to sort of know about the market and the sub markets like Steve was talking about. So I spent like half a day just reading through the Atlanta sub forum. And I don't know if people know that, but bigger pockets like most metro areas have sub forums for local investors. So I, I read through like five or six pages worth of, of forms on the Atlanta market and you see the same names start to pop up, right? And and so, you know, I sort of identified a few people that were agents that obviously had very intimate knowledge of the market and were offering really good advice. They mentioned working with out-of-state investors and stuff. So I reached out to a few of them, had some phone calls with them, and then picked the one that I felt like most aligned with my goals after talking it's with Steve. It's not hard to go on the bigger pockets, uh, you know, forums and find great realtors. They're the ones that are sitting there talking about the area. They're the ones interacting with out-of-state investors, answering questions. They're just really active on bigger pockets. And if you go to the forums and you just type in your city or the city you want to invest in, it'll pull up all the forums and you'll see who's talking, you know, who's answering questions. And it's going to give you a good idea of who you should work with. So I, I agree, you know, um, that biggerpockets.com forward slash even agents is a really good place to find uh, really good realtors in the area you want to invest in. And Joe, this is a common theme on our podcast is when people talk about finding agents or property managers, and just like you did, you didn't just say, oh, here's one person, I'm just going to use them because I see their name. They interview them and talk to them and, you know, take that time to find out who is best suited for you. And I think that's great advice is just don't jump at whoever's first available. Take the time to get to know and connect and figure out, you know, these different realtors and which one is going to to kind of be the best for you. Absolutely. Let's kind of dig into the numbers because that's the part that I <laughs> love. What was, um, you know, the sale price? What were they asking? What did you purchase it for? Rehab costs? Just dig into all of it for us, please. Yeah. So um, it's funny because this deal, so Steve said I couldn't get all three, appreci forced appreciation, minimum or minimum appreciation, forced equity and cash flow. Steve said I couldn't have all three. So I was having a really hard time choosing. And I eventually decided I, there was a minimum appreciation I wanted of at least four to 5% historical in the area. And then I wanted cash flow of at least 200 a month. And what I was realizing is that there wasn't a lot of burr deals that made sense at that price. So I had started shifting to thinking about just putting a, a standard 20% like down payment. And uh, my agent, I don't remember if my agent or I found this one, but from the pictures, it looked pretty turnkey. And so I was like, Hey man, go 
yeah, go check that one out. And it was listed at uh, 135. And didn't we widen the search, Joe? Didn't we? We, we did. Finally, I, I finally said, like, look, we got we to gotta pick a different area. Yeah. And you made me nail down an exact number on what I was looking at, like, at for ROI. And that helped yeah. a lot, too. Because that, 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 that we widened the search into a different area, but then we were able to sort of narrow down with, with being very specific about, okay, it has to meet a minimum ROI or we're not going to look at it. So this one, buying it turnkey, it seemed like it would make, it would make my minimum ROI of, of 11%. And so, um, went and looked at, he looked at, and he was like, Hmm, that, that needs some work. It needs a new roof, needs all new siding like that. But he found out from the listing agent, the listing agent told him like, yeah, we're, uh, we're taking it off the market. Like seller can't find anybody. It's fallen out of contract a few times. And, uh, and so like the listing agent stopped responding to him and was like, but so then my agent reached out to the owner and was like, Hey, I know you're taking this off the market, but I've got, you know, I've got somebody who's, who's willing. Cause he's like, Hey, let's, let's turn this back into a bird deal and do the cash with this and we'll drop the price pretty significantly. And so he reached out to the owner was like, Hey, you know, I've got, I've got a cash buyer. Um, you know, we're going to need to drop the price for all these repairs the, the reasons it's fallen out of contract so many times. And so we negotiated down from, from 135 down to 114. Uh, and that's what we ended up closing on. We were, that's great. Yeah. Um, what's not great is that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, at 114 and we're, we're issued ARV at about 175. So we're, we're looking at like a nice spread there. What's not great was back to that lesson of bringing those team members on early. I hadn't sort of done the legwork to identify a GC yet. And so now my agent is an investor himself and maybe there was a little hubris on my side of being able thinking that like, Oh, I can ballpark these, uh, these rehab numbers. And with his help, like we'll get close enough. Uh, and then with the inspection report, but we were estimating like low to mid twenties for rehab. So like around 20, 24, 25 K. Um, and what we realized is just a lot of little things started to add up. And it was, there was a lot of things that I probably could have just left off and I probably could have arrived at that 25 K number, but I'm the sort of guy that like, once it's brought to me, I sort of want my properties to be in a very good shape when I start renting them out a for the appraisal value. And then B just so I don't have to worry about stuff later on. It's not this constant drain away, like fix it all up now and just get it over with. So what's not great is that the budget is, it went up to about 33, five for the, uh, for the rehab. So that, that definitely ate into, into some of the, uh, into some of the burr for the appraisal. But if I brought a GC on that, I could have had walk that during the due diligence. Maybe I could have negotiated that price down even a little bit more with the seller. But so that was a learning point for me. Um, but Joe, let me butt in there and tell you that a $10,000 mistake is potatoes in the long run. Okay. <laughs> that is oh, I know. A, le a lesson learned that I have heard horror. I've heard hundred thousand dollar and that's where I start cringing a $10,000 mistake. I think you're all right, Joe. <laughs> Thanks, Felipe. It makes you feel better. <laughs> so when, when you finalize your burr, what will you be able to refinance out of it? We'd be able uh, to so, get everything out. Uh, no, I won't get, get everything out. Honestly. I mean, I know that's like the ideal burr, but I, I'm perfectly happy leaving five, 10,000. Honestly, if it meets my ROI, right. So my, mm -hmm. and then, I, then I'm happy leaving money in it. And so this one, depending on the LTV, I, I burr out of it. And that's going to really depend on lending conditions. Cause I've, I've started to search around. I can't really find anybody that's going to cash out refi 80% LTV at, at, at very good interest rates. So I might take 75% LTV. And at that point, I'll leave about 12,000 in the deal. But my ROI will still be 20%, which is almost double what my minimum required ROI was for the deal. So but let's we, be clear on something as well, Joe, for our listeners, and sorry, Ashley, but it's not that you're losing any money. No, and it's no. not it's, you know, I don't want people to think, oh, he's going to lose 5% because he's only getting 75% of his money back. And it didn't work. And it's a, it's a terrible deal. That's not how that works, guys. He still has that money. It's just sitting in that in that uh, in his in his property. And that positively affects his cash flow because right. his mortgage payment is now not, you know, higher than it would be at the 80%. So it's not like he lost anything. It's just sitting in the deal. And I'm okay with that as well, 100%. right? That means you're not as leveraged as you would be at 80%. So, I mean, it's 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 still, you know, you took action and you listened to your mentor. And, uh, and, and I kudos to you, man. I think that's great. Even if it is at 75%, I would still take it. 
Yeah, I think what's also important for people that are trying to get into this is, you know, what Joe did is he's setting, and this is what we talked about, we're setting up the form to duplicate this process over and over again. And I told Joe, I said, I want you to be able to buy a property in every state that you want to using this methodology we're doing. So a base hit still gets you around the field and you'll still win the game. And so a lot of people, they think if I'm not going to hit a home run, I'm not even going to buy the deal. There's a lot to learn. Like if Joe never went forward with these deals because he said, oh, I'm not going to take all the money out or whatever their analogy is, is he, all the lessons that he would have learned from long distance investing would never have happened. And so I think what's important for people to realize is there's, a, you know, it's like there was um, Windows 98. Well, the first Windows 95, Windows 98, Windows 2000, every time is an improvement. And what Joe's doing is he's refining his system which is what I want people to understand is all you're doing at this is you're just making your processes better and better so that eventually I told Joe, I said, I want you to be able to buy five properties in five different States at the same time by using this system. And to me, that's when you know you have a true business and because you're at a disadvantage that you can't go to these cities, you have to rely on your processes and your procedures to make this work. And that to me, really was one of the biggest lessons I wanted Joe to learn out of this whole process. Joe, what kind of, are you using any software? Are you using spreadsheets? What are you using to track, uh, you know, these processes and put these systems in place, you know, from start to finish? No, no, no paid software. Uh, a lot of Excel sheets and, uh, and Google, Google sheets. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much where, where it's all been on. You know, I think for, you know, for managing a, like getting getting a property from buying it through to management, that's fine. Um, where I think the software is really helpful is when you start self managing. But after many conversations with Steve, like I'm past the point of being a a self property manager now. Like it's just I'm realizing how how much that ten percent is such a good deal to just pay a property manager, and so um, I think that's where maybe some of the software would really help people. But Mind Property Management is going to manage it. They're going to do the books on the property and they're going to hand me a nice file at the end of the year with all the bookkeeping and everything for it. And so um, I don't really see a need for, honestly, for anything more than Excel and Google Sheets. I can already see the weight lifting off your shoulders. Oh, it's amazing. Good. I just transferred (laughs) over to property management in February. Oh, it feels so good. And it was like perfect timing because right before COVID and like they handled everything <laughs> with the tenants or that. Oh. People get hung up on that 10% until you realize how much, like talking through the, the time thing I did. Like mm-hmm. I, I told Steve, like, yeah, the, the two properties I manage, they, you know, they take up, I forget what I told them, like an hour a month. And then it's like, well, no, there's, there was 30 minutes there and there was 20 minutes there. And there was, it starts to add up. And when you realize like you can completely just, just get a report in your email that you check once a week or once a month, um, that 10% starts to look like a real good deal. I did enjoy it at one point. I enjoyed the property management and then I just, it bogged me down and I did not enjoy it anymore. And (laughs) you're right. It's such an easy thing to outsource and get rid of. And that's where the time value comes in. Look at things that you are doing and which of those things can you get rid of? Like Felipe, what's an example for you? You cut the grass and you enjoy that now, but like someday you might not want to do that, but that is an easy thing for you to get rid of. Yeah, absolutely. And I have quotes on stuff like that. And I have quotes like on a bunch of stuff when I'm ready to rock and roll for that, definitely do it. But like you said, personally, it doesn't bother me. And it's something that I like. And just like we talked about in the last podcast we did, Ashley, um, the gentleman that uses Cozy, right? It's a free platform for him. And he just enjoys being able to, you know, be in control of that situation. But like like Steve said earlier, it's about goal and mindset. Joe's goal is not to be managing properties. And, you know, Mind offers him that service at 10% of his earnings. So it's great, right? So it just depends on your goal. Like, what is your goal? And let me preface that with, there's not a right or wrong answer here, guys, right? If you love property management, go do it. Ashley says all the time, if it makes you sleep well at night, right? Everyone's goal is a little different. And Joe doesn't want to have to worry about property management. He loves the email, right? And I think that's fantastic, right? So uh, kudos, Joe. I mean, that's awesome. Like you said, that 10% saves you so much time. And like you said, the time does end up adding up kind of like the rehab, right? Before you know it, you're spending (laughs) $10,000 more than you should. That's probably what happens with property management. We think we're just doing three hours, but in reality, it might be like eight or nine because we're not calculating all the cost. 
Well, and I think that, you know, from owning a management company before and, and working, you know, with Mind, I think one of the things a lot of people when they're getting into real estate and they buy that property, you know, they, they, a lot of people feel that's the part that they should do. They feel that, well, I, I own the property. I should at least take care of it because it's just collecting the rent. My flip side to that is, you know, you really need to be careful because you are running a business when you own a piece of real estate. That business has laws, litigation. It's got a lot of, there's a lot of glass in this sandbox of owning a rental property because there's a human being living in that property. And there's a lot of protection rights. And the last thing somebody wants to do is lose all everything they own or get into a lawsuit or something happen because they just didn't know the law. And, you know, Joe and I talked about this and Ashley, you and I have talked about this, that it's like, what is the best use of your time? And it, it very, like you said, uh, Felipe, it may be that that is the best use of your time, but if you do it, make sure that you take it seriously, know the laws, know the regulations, and don't put you, your family, all your finances in a bad position because you didn't take the time to know that there was a new, you know, I mean, especially we've got COVID-19 going on, right? There's a lot of laws around COVID-19 of what you can and cannot do. And that's changed just in the last three months. And so I think it's important that if you get into real estate, you know, you take it from tip to tip as a professional, don't go three quarters of the way through and go, okay, this part I'll do at the end. And I just think it's a, sometimes it's a mindset, sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's not planning properly, but I just think it's important for people to think it through all the way. Agreed, hundred percent. It's all, it's all like you said, building the standard operating procedures and how to be successful that directly positively affects your goal. And and and, and in certain situations, that's one way, and certain the other. Joe, I think you're absolutely right with what you're doing with handing it over to a property management company and worrying about Joe's next homework, or I'm sorry, Steve's next homework for you to go get five deals in five different places. And the last thing you want to be worried about is a tenant that's locked outside of their house at three in the morning. Yeah, especially when I'm overseas deployed in another country, oh, man. Marine Corps. Hey, real oh. quick, Joe, thanks for your service. Thanks for what you're doing, man. I it keeps us all safe. So seriously, thank you. Let's move on to what happened. What's the numbers? Uh, wrap up that property for us. Uh, so renovation should complete next week. Um, and uh, it'll come in the change. Or I think we only had one change order. So that bumped it from 32.5 up to that 33.5 I mentioned for the, uh, the rehab. And then uh, I haven't really found any good deals on, on seasoning it or on refinancing it inside the six month seasoning period. So I think I'm just going to wait and, uh, allow it to season a little bit. Appreciation seems to be taking hold in the neighborhood. And so I think there's a couple properties on the market right now that if they sell between now and, and when I'm going to refinance, it'll, it'll bump up my ARV a little bit. So I'm just going to let it sit for a while, turn it over to property management in August. And then, uh, yeah, probably this fall later this fall. Uh, or the winner, then I'll refinance out of it. You know, I, I would say to people watching, I think that, you know, we're in a, we have a certain uh, window in time right now with, with everything going on. And there's going to be a lot of deals in place coming very soon with, with pricing. And I think this is the time that, you know, watching this show, watching the other shows, being involved in bigger pockets, this is when you sharpen that mental ax before you start swinging. And I think pretty soon, having everything, knowing what your goals are, knowing the strategies and the tactics you're going to use by really thinking this through, writing it out, having a mentor, getting on bigger pockets, doing all these things so that when the right deal does approach, whether it's locally, whether it's out of state or even out of country, you know exactly what you're doing. And, you know, everyone's going to be pretty soon, you'll see everyone's going to be running away from real estate because prices will start falling. That is the time, in my opinion, that more wealth will be created probably in the next 18 months than has been created in the last 10 years. And that's going to be caused by people that did not run their businesses correctly and didn't think things through to have, you know, the, the right strategies in place. So I think that, like I told Joe, I'm like, I want you to be ready to be able to purchase five properties when you're overseas. I mean, this deal, uh, maybe Joe, you can tell them where you actually signed the documents on this deal. Cause this shows, this shows a true business model. So tell, tell them where you were when you, when you signed. I was, I was out in the field in the tree line, as we like to say in the Marine Corps, uh, doing a field op when, so this, this little guy right here is, you know, other than Steve, my, my MVP, because <laughs> uh, I pretty much did this entire deal on this to include, yeah, I closed on what, while I was out, uh, out training. So, well, you just led us into our next segment there, Joe, our that next was a good segue, <laughs> <laughs> but now you can't use those answers. So, um, this segment so aside is, from Steve. Yeah. Oh, man. 
Plus, we don't want it to get to Steve's head, you know, that he's uh, an MVP. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so who is someone uh, on your team who has really helped make this possible for you? And we call this segment the... MVP. MVP. <laughs> MVP. That's right, Joe. There you go. Okay, so who is that person that has made that impact uh, in your real estate business? So not Steve. Can't pick Steve. Yeah, try and think of someone else. Okay. Yeah, we already oh, yeah. talked no, that's, enough that's about good. Steve. I've, yeah. I've got, yeah, <laughs> no, I've got a good MVP. Nick Fitzpatrick, my uh, my agent um, that I found on Bigger Pockets. He's been he's been awesome. You know, he was flexible. He took the time to really ask me about my goals and make sure that you know he was completely understood, like what I was looking for and the, and the objectives I was trying to hit. Um, completely responsive in terms of drive, like dropping things, driving out to a property, giving me the pictures and the videos. Like he's worked with out of state investors before and it shows. Um, he's also, he knows uh, he, he's, he's emotionally in tune with people investing and in, people buying a house too. Cause he was like, he made, he, he had a, like a, you know, heart to heart with me after we fell out of the second one. Cause I was feeling a little bit down and he took the time to be like, Hey man, like you still good? Like, are we still, you know, let's, let's reevaluate. Like, let me know where you're at. Let me know what you're thinking. Um, so he's just a great guy. Uh, he'll work his butt off and, uh, you know, he's, and he's sent, you know, he's got, he's got a good team there too, in terms of, because he is an investor, he's got different contractors and subs and stuff like that. So, yeah. What are some things that you could, if for someone who's looking to find an out-of-state realtor, what are some questions that, you asked him kind of during mm -hmm. that initial interview process. Yeah. So, I mean, the first question was, have you worked with out-of-state investors? Yes. Okay. What, like, what kind of deals did, have you done? And I try not to, to put leading questions there. Right. So just to kind of see like what he comes, he's like, well, I do, I've done bird deals with out-of-state investors. I was like, okay, perfect. Um, you know, I asked him, you know, in terms of where he was located, you know, how would he be able to get to these areas quickly uh, around Atlanta, the neighborhoods we were thinking of, you know, cause if it's, it's one, if, it, if he's living on a suburb on the far North side of the city and on the, I want to invest on the far South side of the city, like he's probably not going to be as, you know, he's probably not going to want to drive down there all the time. So location, especially in a massive Metro like that is probably important as well. And then, I sort of just want, I got, I sort of gave him what my goals were. And then I t asked him to tell me like what areas of Atlanta do you think meet these goals and, and explain to me why. And uh, that sort of allowed him just sort of like free talk in terms of me getting a feel for is his knowledge of the area, you know, really in depth. I mean, he could have been blowing smoke. He wasn't, but uh, you know, it, it allowed me him to just sort of free spiel and uh, me get a feel for like, does he know his stuff? That's great. And I think just that you found him on the bigger pockets forums and that he knew what a bird deal was. I mean, a lot yeah. of real estate agents don't even know that. Uh, but thank you for sharing uh, today's MVP. And Steve, we know, is also your MVP. So recognize <laughs> yes, him a little course, bit. Steve. Let's move on to our next segment. Felipe, do you want to take us into that? With the rookie request line. <laughs> So I couldn't stop laughing. Anyways, so the next segment of the show, Joe and Steve, is called the Rookie Request Line. You can reach us anytime at 1-888-5-ROOKIE to leave us a voicemail, and we might use it on the next show. Joe, Steve, are you guys ready? Ready. All right, here's today's question. Hey, how you doing? My name is Dalton from Massachusetts. I'm looking to get into a house hack sometime in the near future here, so I'm just starting to do my research and talk a lot about finding locations and analyzing deals, but what exactly do you go through when you analyze the deal? Thanks. Steve, you want to start? Or yeah, start? Steve, <laughs> that's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, it's one word. It's called action, right? So a lot of times we hide behind going online, going on bigger pockets. I didn't hear anything about what action he could be taking. Action could be actually making phone calls to sellers, knocking on doors, uh, doing actual things to make uh, you know, uh, an improvement on where he's at. So my advice would be come up with a plan, right? Really sit there and say, what do I want my life to look like as a result of owning real estate? What is my end goal? And once you know what that is, it could be a certain amount of assets. It could be a certain amount of cash flow. But really take the time and figure that out. Once you know what that is, 
now it's a matter of opening the front door, walking down the steps and, and making it happen. And a lot of times we get so caught up in spreadsheets and conversations that we never actually just get it done. And, you know, Joe's a great example. Joe, Joe had the spreadsheets, but Joe was out there doing all of his homework, taking action. And that's the biggest hurdle most people have to overcome. It's like a, getting a locomotive to move down the tracks. You just got to get that momentum going. And once it goes, it'll, it'll happen. Getting that action going is the hardest thing. And I'll uh, add to that by saying, you know, I may have done this, this deal completely virtually, you know, I've never set foot in Atlanta and, and whatnot. But for that first deal, there is, if you're having trouble, you know, getting started, there is something to be said for um, physically meeting with somebody who's going to push you into that action and being, uh, you know, held accountable. I think what that looks like in many cases is finding that, you know, real estate or investor friendly real estate agent, and then actually taking the action of going and looking through how at houses with them. What that did for me when I, when I did my very first pre-deal, cause that was sort of what got me um, into that first step. Cause I also sat around for a while, did a lot of reading and research before I ever did my first bird deal. But it wasn't until I realized like I went and met an agent, started walking through houses and then realized like, well, I'm, this person is doing this stuff for me. And like, I, I don't want them to work for free. Right. And so that, and that like putting a face, it's, it's easy to like, Oh yeah, I meet with somebody on the bigger pockets forums or we, or we message on Instagram and it's like, Oh, we connected. But sometimes for that very first deal, maybe what you need is go meet that person who's going to let you achieve or help you achieve those objectives and realize like they've got a living to make. And if you, if you feel a little bit of responsibility for not wasting their time, maybe that's what pushes you into that next step. And just putting in those low ball offers. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you might take offers. a deal, just practicing putting in offers then you'll, you know, maybe you'll get something if you're, you know, not finding deals. You're, he's obviously analyzing them. He's got his per- spreadsheets. And if you're not confident, you know, that it's working based off the purchase price, then lower your offer so that the deal does work for you. Well, and I think the challenge is, is people do what they should, not what they must. And so if, if he had an account, if he had someone holding him accountable, and said, hey, by next week, you better have 50 phone calls made. He would probably make those phone calls. If I said, if you don't do it, we're done talking, that's it. He'd probably get them done, right? If it was like, well, maybe you should, but you probably got stuff to do and you're in San Diego, so you can go hang out. Maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. It's not a priority. And so when your should becomes a must, that's when action starts coming into play. So it's just, it has to move up on the priority list to make action actually happen, in my opinion. That's great advice, Steven. Steve actually did that to me on the time blocking thing. He told me if I didn't write down my time every day, he was not going to talk to me again. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And you got it done, Which, right? But you yeah. got it done. And now I was like, geez, what a big regret. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you can't roll back kidding. time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have a, a few questions that we like to ask at the end of the show. So, Steve, we had you on before, so we're going to ask these questions to Joe to get to know you. Um, Felipe, do you want to go ahead and take the first one? Yeah, I'll take the first one. Hey, Joe, what is the biggest piece of advice that you would give a rookie that you took from Steve? man, the biggest biggest. lesson learned from Steve. I think the biggest lesson learned, and we've sort of touched it multiple times, but just to make it concise is, is you got to build the team. Um, and that, and that goes not just for out of state real estate investing, but that's for local real estate investing. Like everybody's got, most people have a W2. And even if you don't have a W2, you don't know all the aspects of what there is to know about investing in real estate. So if, if people are looking for next steps, you should be looking at who do I need on my team and how am I going to get them? Uh, and that goes for deals in your local area or deals out of state. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think after listening to this episode, a lot of people are going to be looking for a mentor and someone uh, to help them get that first deal done. And I think even just throughout the show, you gave a lot of advice as to how to add value to your mentor and how to be a good mentee. But now let's move on to the super fun rookie hazing. And uh, I know Steve will probably help you out here, but what oh, song is your guilty pleasure? And can you sing a few lyrics for us? Okay, so I'll, uh, big fan of the show. I've loved all your guests. But if I have a bone to pick, I would say that 
some of them are not putting the guilty into the guilty pleasure part because some of them have picked like genuinely great songs. Some of the songs <laughs> that, that are like great music. You know, you are um, absolutely right. Yeah. The song, the song that I'm about to butcher, no self-respecting Marine should ever sing in their truck on the way home from work to. And I'm ashamed to admit I have from time to time. So Steve can join me if he wants, but he don't have to because he's, he's sort of like the VIP here. But uh, call me. Oh, me. no. Oh, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Wait I don't a minute. Know, we Steve are not know letting song. Steve no, out of this. He's not yeah. a rookie. It's no, rookie hazing. No, no. It's rookie hazing. No, that's okay. I got to look out that's for okay. my mentor. <laughs> I may be too maybe. old to even know what this song is. Okay. Go for it, Joe. Call Me Maybe by Carly Rae Jepsen. You know it? Oh, my. Yeah. No, I never even heard it. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Here we go. <clears throat> hey, I just met you. And this is crazy, but here's my number, so call me maybe. It's hard to look right at you, baby, but here's my number, so call me maybe. <laughs> Yay, yes, good Joe, job. That was awesome. You know this and is I being recorded, you. right, Joe? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> so now Steve does Steve's going to hold song. that over your head. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Steve, can you tell us a little bit about where everyone can find out some more information about you? Sure. Uh, well, if they want to know more about Mind Property Management, they can go to mind.co, M-Y-N-D.co. And uh, we are in 16 different markets across the U.S., managing uh, about 7,500 properties. So uh, we do have a platform to help you find properties. We've got all the teams in place to, to help you, just like we've helped Joe. And uh, if somebody wants to find me personally, they can find me on Instagram at Rosenberg Steve, R O Z E N B E R G Steve, uh, as well as all the other social media, Facebook, uh, other LinkedIn, other channels. And uh, yeah, happy to help, happy to have conversations. I, I do it a lot. And, uh, you know, we're all, we're a very small community when you think of the grand scheme of things. So if we don't help each other, then, you know, why are we doing this, in my opinion? So I, I, I always try to give back as much as I can to, to the investor community. Yeah. And as much as I've been hard on Steve during this uh, recording, he really does take the time to, you know, help as many people as he can. Um, and he loves to talk real estate and especially mindset and just has great advice on that. So go follow him. And he just gives out tons of free content. Uh, Joe, what about you? So you can find me on Bigger Pockets. Uh, I'm relatively active on there. Don't post a whole lot, but i uh... I, I do message a lot of people on bigger pockets. Uh, I'm on Facebook mostly just to be in uh, actually the Steve's uh, investment group. It's not, it's not mastermind. You just changed the name. What's, what's the name now? Think tank, think tank, think tank. real estate. There we go. Yeah. So Steve's think tank. And then also the, uh, the rookie uh, face, the rookie podcast, Facebook page, but I'm not super active on Facebook. Instagram is probably the best way to reach out to me um, at devil dog investor is my, uh, my handle on Instagram. So message me on there or, or just, uh, follow me. I post stuff about ongoing projects. I, I started it just sort of document, um, you know, my journey and mistakes I make and, and wins and stuff. So, uh, and I like to, uh, I like to follow, uh, other investors on there. So, well, thank you guys so much for coming on the show and their whole journey with this $20,000 and buying this out of state property is, is all documented and it's going to be on bigger pockets, YouTube, correct? Yeah, we did. Uh, Joe and I did a whole video documentary on the whole process so that everybody can follow along. They can see, uh, you know, the wins and the struggles that, that Joe goes through. And, and I think it's a great learning experience for anyone that wants to, you know, get involved in investing, whether it's local or out of state. I think it's all the same, uh, but it definitely shows what needs to be done and, and what kind of pitfalls will be out there if you're not, you know, careful in your selection process. So yeah, it's, it'll all be process. It's a collaboration between Mind Property Management and Bigger Pockets. We're so happy that join forces with, uh, you know, Bigger Pockets and do this together. And I think it'll help a lot of people out there. I really do. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on the show today. I'm Ashley Kerr at Wealth from Rentals and he's Felipe Mejia at Felipe Mejia REI. 